No, not Arendelle. Yeah, yeah, it was entertaining. Yeah. Okay. April 6th, 1940. We've talked about it for a few months now, the various German or Allied plans for Norway or Norwegian waters. Well, this week those plans finally begin to come to fruition. This week, both German and British ships head for Norway. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Wang Jingwei's collaborationist government for the Japanese was set up in Nanjing, China, while in the West, following a French change of prime minister, all sorts of possibilities for beating the Germans without engaging them in France were floated. Actually, there are some changes to the British ministries this week. Lord Woolton becomes Minister of Food. Well, Frederick Marquis, the first Earl of Woolton, does. His name will gain fame as the inspiration behind the Lord Woolton Pie, or just Woolton Pie, which is widely served in wartime Britain once rationing and shortages of things like meat make other dishes difficult to prepare. It is not especially well received, nor are most other wartime substitute dishes. However, carrot cake, though not invented during the war, experiences a boom in popularity. It's tasty. Anyway, as for ministers, on the third, the Ministerial Defense Committee chaired by Winston Churchill, First Lord of the Admiralty, replaces the singular Minister of Coordination of Defense. One of Churchill's first acts is to once and for all get full consent for mining Norwegian waters. This is not the sowing of indiscriminate destruction as Germany does it. It is the carefully planned move against the enemy, and all the shipping is warned of the danger zone. Now, as we've seen, the British are not alone in making plans for Norway. On April 2nd, Adolf Hitler sets the date for the German invasions of Norway and Denmark for April 9th. Colonel Oster, who, as we've seen, has passed German plans on in the past, tells this to the Dutch military attaché, who in turn tells the Norwegian attaché. He does not tell Oslo, though. It will later turn out that he is a Nazi supporter. On the 3rd, three German supply ships disguised as colliers leave Germany for Narvik. By disguise, I mean they carry coal as they should, but underneath the coal is loads of artillery and ammunition. German troops are on destroyers waiting for the call to leave port for Stavanger, Trondheim, Kristiansand, Oslo, and Bergen. Hitler's stated strategic aim for the Norway invasion is prevent British encroachment in Scandinavia and the Baltic. Further, it will guarantee our ore base in Sweden and give our Navy and Air Force a wider start line against Britain. But the Germans do not think they can fight a sustained campaign against the British Navy in Norwegian waters. So all plans need deception, speed, and secrecy. And keeping a lid on things means keeping the number of troops to a minimum. But you're still talking over 100,000 men, all told, with all their equipment. How do you move them up to Norway without the British and French finding out? A slow-moving armada of transports will be easily spotted before reaching Norwegian waters. So. They're going to move the troops in warships and not transports. This will get the men there faster, sure, but the warships can't carry all the stores and the equipment that the men will need. So all of it is to be sent by a fairly elaborate system of auxiliary operations, like the disguised colliers, who will reach Norwegian ports and then come up with a variety of reasons why, oh no, they can't leave. Others leave this week for Trondheim and Stavanger. Large reinforcements for the first smallish wave of troops will come three to five days after the invasion kicks off, sent to Oslo and then points further by land, sea and air. The Danish invasion is focused on Aalborg at the tip of Jutland. This is going to be taken by a parachute platoon and an airborne battalion, with infantry moving up quickly from the German border for support and five groups on ships making landings on the west coast of Jutland. Air power is to play a big role. Stavanger, for example, is to be taken by air. 500 transport planes are to bring in 3,000 airborne troops in total to take the largest airfield in Norway. After the first 1,500 or so have landed, transports will bring infantry and artillery to the harbor. The Narvik group of 2,000 initial troops leaves Germany at midnight the 6th, escorted partway by the battleships Gneisenau and Scharnhorst. The Trondheim group sails at the same time one cruiser and four destroyers with nearly 2,000 men. The Bergen Group, 2,000 men on two cruisers and nine smaller ships, are to leave the 7th. 
they are soon to be reinforced by aircraft and transport ships. The Kristiansan group is smaller, only around a thousand men on a cruiser and 11 smaller ships, but it has a major mission to land a party of men at Arendal and cut the phone line that leaves Norway there for Britain, sabotaging Norwegian communication with the outside world. The Oslo group, on the other hand, has more resources since Oslo is the capital. Three cruisers, supporting ships, and a bunch of minesweepers will leave the 7th and land roughly 2,000 men. A parachute regiment will then drop in and secure Fornebu airfield, paving the way for transport aircraft to bring in infantry and engineers. Artillery, AA guns, gasoline, and tanks will then arrive by transport ship. One final little group of four minesweepers are to be sent to Egersund with but 150 men. They are to cut the phone line there that goes to Peterhead, Scotland. Those landing numbers of troops might sound small, but the ships are to return immediately to Germany and quickly try to shuttle the tens of thousands of additional men needed to secure the cities under attack. London does receive intel of German troops and ships concentrating in northern German ports. And on the 5th, Britain and France send Norway a note saying they reserve the right to act to deprive Germany of Norwegian resources. Actually, the day before, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain makes a speech and says Hitler has missed the bus in respect to winning a fight against the British in the field. He says the British are now well prepared for that fight. British ships soon leave Scapa Flow to mine Norwegian waters, but you know, it takes time to get there. Throughout April 6th, British forces steamed eastward across the North Sea at the beginning of a three-day passage. That night, when the British ships were still 48 hours from Norwegian territorial waters, a reconnaissance aircraft reported intense shipping activity and brilliantly lit wharves at the German port of Eckenförde, near Kiel. Another British reconnaissance aircraft sighted a larger German ship, possibly a battle cruiser, steaming 20 miles north of Heligoland. But the British naval commanders, when told of the intense flurry of German naval activity, do not realize that these are signs of action and not reaction. They're too preoccupied with mine laying. The British Admiralty thinks that the Germans are going to try to break out into the Atlantic to attack British sea lanes. So they deployed much of the home fleet a long way from Norway. Still. German warships are targets, so both the British and French do send their own warships to intercept the Germans, who even have a new type of ship at sea this week. On March 31st, the first German armed merchant cruiser, the Atlantis, sails out for marauding operations against Allied shipping. As of this day, so far for the war, 753,803 tons of Allied shipping has been sunk by U-boats, 145,697 by mines. Germany has lost 18 submarines. And looking into the future for the month of April, German U-boats will only sink seven Allied ships at a cost of five of their own. The Allies lose 58 ships total for 158,200 tons. Something that will continue for more than a month begins on April 5th. The Polish officers held by the Soviet Red Army since the invasion of Poland last September and October are sent in small groups from their POW camp in Kozelsk towards Smolensk. The groups range in size from 60 to 300, and some 5,000 men will set off on the journey escorted by the secret police. I say set off because they never arrive in Smolensk. Instead, in their uniforms, they are led to the woods near the village of Katyn and killed by shots in the back of the neck. Their bodies will be discovered three years from now. And that is the week. A week heavy with naval action. Germany assembling and beginning to send an invasion force to Norway and Britain sending a mine laying force there. One thing did happen in the skies of note though. On the 5th, a British reconnaissance flight from Baghdad flies over the oil seaport Batum on the Black Sea. Unlike last week's recon mission, this one comes under fire but escapes. The photos it takes are soon examined in Britain and plans are made for a raid in a few weeks to cut off the Soviet and German oil supply from the Caucasus. So Hitler is to invade another two nations of Europe. It's worked out well for him so far. I mean, think of Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland. And he hasn't really had to fight the Western European nations for any of it. But now, 
It's all coming to a head with British and German ships of war heading towards each other and Norway the prize. For the nations of Western Europe, this war is about to finally get very real. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Harald Grundeschen from Norway. It's Harald's contribution that enables us to send these episodes to our fans, even in remote places like the Faroe Islands, Greenland, and Madagascar. If you have not already, join the Time Ghost Army on Patreon or at timeghost.tv. The war effort needs you. And if you want to know what Wulton Pie is all about, check out our Breakfast Club episode where we find that out too. It's right here. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. Thank you.